just just in our discussion here in the last few minutes, you can you can just get enthusiastic about yeah. it. You can get excited about it, and uh, that's what you'd like to think you're going to con you convey to the millennials and anybody else that's in the situation. You know, so. Welcome to the new Cyber Frontier, bringing you the latest news on the local Colorado economy and initiatives that focus on the development of cybersecurity economics. You don't have to be a computer or cybersecurity expert to get plugged in. Your host, Chris Gorog, brings it straightforward, asks the tough questions, and brings the cyber world to a level of understanding for everyone. Chris is personable and opens up with our guests on the issues we all would like to see addressed. You can find us on the web at www.newcyberfrontier.com. Now join our host as he introduces the topic for today's New Cyber Frontier. So welcome today. We're talking about cybersecurity and uh, today we have a special treat. We have General Ed Anderson, who is the Interim Executive Director of the Colorado Cybersecurity Effort, the NCIC, so National Cyber Intelligence Center. Right. Ed, welcome today. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Well, we are definitely glad to have you and uh, definitely looking to get your input here as well as the other founding members mm -hmm. of this effort in Colorado Springs. So Ed, first of all, give us a background. Tell us where you've been, what, what your, your background is. I know, well, we'll hear from you. Oh, okay. You mean about me personally? You personally, yes. Okay. Well, uh, 39 years in the Army, uh, graduated from the Military Academy. Um, came from an army family and so army was the only thing I'd ever known for the vast majority of my life until I retired from the army in 2004 uh, and at that time I was the deputy commander at uh, US Northern Command here in Peterson Air Force Base and uh, and also the vice commander of US element of NORAD uh, <clears throat> excuse me so when I retired I joined uh, an international consulting firm you're probably familiar with them Booz Allen Hamilton uh, here in town, their office they had here in town. I was with them for about five years as a principal, a little over five years. Uh, and then I left there, and that's when I got associated with UCCS. And uh, Chancellor Shockley Zellerbach asked if I would come work for her part-time, 50% of my time, um, as uh, uh, basically a military advisor. My title is Executive Director for Strategic Initiatives for Military Space Science and Security Initiatives. Um, so I did that. And then the other 50% of my time was as uh, President of the National Homeland Defense Foundation here in town. Um, we took that uh, operation down about oh, a year ago and uh, and then so I was just doing UCCS there for a while until this opportunity came up uh, in February and uh, so I've been involved since then uh, as the interim executive director as well as my responsibilities at UCCS. Well it definitely sounds like you're the right man for the job. Well, <laughs> see, let me make it clear I was not hired because of my cyber expertise. I was just going to ask that. I was going to say, do you consider yourself a cyber person? No, I do not. But the reason they brought me on was because, as I mentioned, I was the deputy at U.S. Northern Command when I retired. But I also was there when we stood up the command mm -hmm. from, from scratch. After 9-11 uh, happened, the decision was made back in the Pentagon that we would do away with U.S. Space Command, which was at Peterson at the time, and we would reform U.S. Northern Command. And so I then became the deputy of that as we were starting it. So I've got some experience in starting organizations from scratch, and that's really what, okay. they, what, what uh, everybody was looking for. We'll be right back with the rest of today's show right after these brief messages from our sponsors. Cyber Resilience Institute helps build strong cyber communities designed to prevent members from attack. Like building a neighborhood watch, it takes coordination and a sharing community to protect our identities and valuables in the virtual world. Typically, we hear that organizations know they need to do something to protect their cyber assets, but don't know where to begin. Let Cyber Resilience Institute help your community create an action plan. Cyber Resilience Institute will build your community or business marketplace so that it is designed to support a collective cyber defense. 
Contact them for more information at cyberresilienceinstitute.org. Well, it definitely sounds like you're the right man for the job. Well, let, me see. let me make it clear. I was not hired because of my cyber expertise. I was just going to ask that. I was going to say, do you consider yourself a cyber person? No, I do not. But the reason they brought me on was because, as I mentioned, I was the deputy at U.S. Northern Command when I retired. But I also was there when we stood up the command mm -hmm. from, from scratch. After 9-11 uh, happened, the decision was made back in the Pentagon that we would do away with U.S. Space Command, which was at Peterson at the time, and we would reform U.S. Northern Command. And so I then became the deputy of that as we were starting it. So I've got some experience in starting organizations from scratch, and that's really what, okay. they, what uh, everybody was looking for. So cyber, though. Yeah. From somebody like me, I've been in data with cyber for so many years. I don't, I don't, you know, I have a hard time imagining not being able to understand what what people are talking about. But if you go from almost like a lay or a high level look at cyber, what's your impression of what's needed and what we're doing here? Well, first of all, let me let me um, give you a little caveat here because, uh, as I said, prior to you, a deputy at U.S. Northern Command, I was the deputy at U.S. Space Command. And in U.S. Space Command f for the military, we had the responsibility for cyber. Mm -hmm. So we had uh, computer network attack and computer network defense. And, and what we did was we consolidated those into a joint task force for security or for cyber uh, or for computer network operations, mm -hmm. CNO. So I did get quite a bit of exposure to and, and some foundation uh, for cyber as a result of that experience and as a part of that, you know, visiting CIA and NSA and all these other three-letter organizations and all that kind of stuff. So those are very government-centric. Right. So we talked a little bit before that, that we started talk, recording here about my background mm -hmm. being critical infrastructure, mm -hmm. industrial automation. And I, you know, I said about five to seven years ago, I started saying, well, what is this information technology, information security, and why does everybody think that cybersecurity, because I'd worked in it for 15 plus years, is all about securing information? Mm -hmm. Because in that critical infrastructure, those machines transfer the same piece of information a million times over 10 years. That information, the data transfer, is meaningless. Mm -hmm. So a whole industry for machine-to-machine -machine communications, and especially industrial automation, communicate, or critical infrastructure, uh, your gas, railway, mm -hmm. you know, infrastructure. Utilities. We don't care about data. Mm -hmm. So why is it, and I, this was the question I asked myself, why is it that cybersecurity is all about data and data information security? So have you ever, you know, everything you're talking about seems to come from that, that military where mm -hmm. literally you put up walls around your equipment and you trust that equipment because it's in your control. So now all you need to worry about is the line between right. you and the rest of the world. Right. But if you look out across the the net, you know the the city here, there's millions more devices on poles mm -hmm. than there is in somebody's control. Right. So the whole the whole other half of cybersecurity is looking at how does security need to be addressed in those, and the two coming together is, is a big question mark, is mm. what I see. Mm. Well, I mean, I think part of this is driven by uh, the public gets exposed periodically to the things that happen to Target, to mm -hmm. Sony, uh, you know, to the big companies like that, uh, in the, even in the government OPM, and the, and the hack on OPM and so on and so forth. And so they hear about that and they relate that to cybersecurity, and, and that's how they formulate, uh, I think, in their minds, and myself included to a degree, uh, what, how you view cybersecurity and how it has emerged mm -hmm. in, con in contrast to what, you're what you described as machine to machine and that kind of thing. So it's, um, it's probably, uh, how's the best way to say this? Um, not well, I mean, we are shaped by what we hear. Mm -hmm. And so we've heard those things and we've heard how bad they are and who's doing them and 
how much more can be done and so on and so forth. And all of that creates, I think, in some folks' minds, a considerable anxiety. It kind of goes back to that point we were talking about earlier where they, they did that test and they had the placebo and everything that's cybersecurity. Nobody touched it, but they went to the placebo kind of thing. Uh, we've just created a mindset or mentality here that makes us very, very conscious, I think, of cybersecurity. Whoever came up with the term a long time ago, it's, mm -hmm. it's stuck. Yeah. <laughs> well, and and I, that's what I relate that as information security. Yeah. And okay. I, it's a, it's almost under a, an entirely different practice, and the whole umbrella would be cybersecurity. But that's maybe the definition according to Chris Gorlock. So, <laughs> for what what it matters. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure that they would agree. I'm not sure even I would agree with that. I'm not sure it's just information because, um, again, as it is explained in many cases, in many uh, fora, that uh, it's it, the, the discussion is about breaking into code. It's not about realizing what the that it's involving just information transfer and that kind of thing. It's It's... It's so complex, I guess, is, is, is really what I'm saying. It is. And I, th I tell you, I think, interestingly enough, I've always been concerned because I talk cyber, you talk cyber, other people, and we have it in our own minds what that is, but it's probably not the same thing you have in your mind. I know it's not after talking exactly. to you. And, but yet we think we're talking the same thing. Literally, I went in search of why is everybody talking something that I've been working for 15 years, yeah. and I wouldn't consider that... Yeah the sole purpose of cyber. Yeah. And, yeah. and it is, it, it definitely, it's one of those things that defining it, and that's what uh, uh, our member for CRI from Cyber Maryland has brought to us. He said, hey, the first couple of years of putting together an effort was getting everybody to talk the same language mm -hmm. and understand what, the, when I say that's an apple, you know that's an apple and we mean it's the same thing. Yep, yep. Okay, yeah. so shifting gears a little bit to the, the NCIC effort. Okay. Tell us about your thoughts for you know, where we're at now and maybe some timelines and what we'll see. Okay. Well, uh, we're certainly in the early stages. I mean, if you're familiar with or have any experience with startups, uh, you know that's a very difficult piece because you're basically starting from the ground and building this tremendous facility. And, and I use that uh, figuratively, not, not uh, literally. But, uh, and, and, um, so we're bringing together the pieces, but at the same time, we're trying to do it quickly. We've gotten the guidance from the governor and, and Chancellor Shockley that uh, we want to get this done as soon as we possibly can. So um, it might be helpful if I could to just go back and give you a little bit of background as to how the thing got started. because. Okay. And you'll probably get this from other folks as well, but it really is the brainchild of the governor. And as you know, when he did his State of the State address, he specifically mentioned the NCIC and that it would be based here. And as I understand it, and I've been with the governor several times on this uh, associated with the NCIC, is that he was on a trade trip overseas last fall, and one of the stops was Israel. And uh, during that stop, they divided, devoted a whole day to a discussion of cybersecurity, whatever that is, and, uh, and how they handle it and what they do and so on and so forth. And to include, at the conclusion of that day, a discussion with uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, and his emphasis of why it's so important and all that kind of thing. And so he, he the governor, was very impressed with that and brought that back here and was very interested in getting something started uh, for Colorado and ultimately for the nation. Uh, as he looked around, what he found was that down here at, uh, in Colorado Springs at UCCS, UCCS has been uh, leading a task community task force for oh, quite a while, about a year or so we've been doing that, uh, with the intent of establishing a center here for workforce development, cyber workforce development, mm -hmm. which included a cyber crisis uh, analysis center and so on and so forth. And um, so he saw... His idea that he saw in Israel, he saw this effort down here that had already gotten started in the community. He saw that there was this tremendous um, infrastructure of cyber companies down here at varying sizes and things like that. He saw the, the military facilities that were down here, many of which are either involved in cyber in the military or certainly are 
customers of cyber, if you will. So it just seemed like all the pieces were right here in Colorado Springs. And so from that came the NCIC. Mm -hmm. So we have in the short time that we've been going here since I guess it's been about January, we have already gotten a 501c3 status. Uh, we've gotten the governing documents in place, the bylaws and, and so on and so on and so forth. We have a board of governors that we're filling out right now. We have nine. Our bylaws say we want to have 15. So uh, that's yet we'll, we'll be meeting again on 9 May, the board. Mm -hmm. And uh, so my hope is that we'll fill out the remainder of the board and get that up and full up and running. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. We have uh, the three centers, as you know, which constitute the uh, NCIC, the Cyber Institute, the Rapid Response Center, and the Cyber Research Education and Training Center. Uh, so those are the three legs of the stool, if you want to use that an analogy. And um, associated with that then, uh, we have a board of advisors for each one of those legs. Mm -hmm. And then we have a, a, a person who heads the board of advisors for each one of those legs. We've identified two of those, Martin Wood. He is the head of the advisory board for the Cyber Research Education and Training Center. Uh, Kyle Hibble is the lead for the uh, uh, Cyber Institute, and we're in the process of identifying two more, uh, looks like it's going to be two people, co-chairs, for the Rapid Response Cell mm -hmm. Center, and uh, we'll finalize that at the board meeting on 9 May. So, excuse me, we've got uh, those all are, are all in place and, and we are working with a consultant firm out of Dol uh, Denver, a, a very well-known and popular, uh, big uh, consulting firm, who has volunteered to help us for each of the centers as well as the overall center to develop the, the uh, concept of operations, the business plan, the commercial plan, the, the vision, the mission, and so on and so forth, all those things that need to be in place. They will work with each of those advisory boards for the centers to define that for each of the, the um, centers. So that's going to be the work that's going to be ongoing here. and. Uh, uh, will be vital in terms of defining where we're going. The one big piece we have uh, uh, identified for the future where we would, you could perhaps consider that is going to be the unveiling of the NCIC uh, is uh, either in late November or early December we're going to host um, oh, maybe five to ten go uh, governors, uh, mayors from across the country, uh, county commissioners and city officials and so on and so forth and bring them here under the auspices of the Cyber Institute because the purpose of the Cyber Institute is to educate elected officials mm -hmm. because that was one of the major shortcomings that the governor uh, saw was the fact that there was this uh, uh, need, vital need to educate these folks about what are the components of cyber and kind of define cyber as we talked about earlier mm -hmm. to try to get everybody off the same on the same sheet of music and um, and his vision and our vision obviously is that uh, the cyber institute will be patterned somewhat after the aspen institute and so you know i'm sure of the aspen institute and how well recognized they are nationally and and that kind of thing so that's, uh, that's kind of the direction we want to go, and, and that's the intent that we'll do that first event uh, in that time frame around November, December, and that'll be the stand-up, if you the will. unveiling, huh? Yeah. We'll be right back with the rest of today's show right after these brief messages from our sponsors. Cyber Resilience Institute helps build strong cyber communities designed to prevent members from attack. Like building a neighborhood watch, it takes coordination and a sharing community to protect our identities and valuables in the virtual world. Typically, we hear that organizations know they need to do something to protect their cyber assets, but don't know where to begin. Let Cyber Resilience Institute help your community create an action plan. Cyber Resilience Institute will build your community or business marketplace so that it is designed to support a collective cyber defense. Contact them for more information at cyberresilienceinstitute.com. 
www.ghostofthecoast.org. So I heard a, a couple times, and quite a bit, you said the governor came to UCCS, was the big entity here. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned the people that you've already kind of put in the key roles. I believe they're affiliated with UCCS. Do you feel that th no, no, go ahead. this is a, a, a something that UCCS is really kind of taking the lead on, mm -hmm. like a software engineering institute that's under Carnegie Mellon or something like that? Or is it community and bigger than that? Are you looking to include other organizations? What's your thought there? Oh, definitely bigger than that. And we don't want to communicate, as a matter of fact, that UCCS is the lead for the NCIC. And we don't want to communicate that it's only focused on Colorado Springs. Mm -hmm. We want to make it clear that this is a Colorado thing first, and then ultimately it'll become a national thing, and that UCCS has a role, but it is not the lead. And we are bringing in other organizations and things like that. So on the board of directors, uh, we have, of course, Chancellor Shockley, UCCS. Uh, we have the mayor, not UCCS, of course. Uh, we have Eric Matizek, he's not UCCS, and he's currently up at DU, but he's also the Chief Inform Innovation of, uh, Officer, I guess, for the uh, for state of Colorado. Uh, we have uh, Nancy Phillips, who is the president of, uh, or CEO of Via West, which is a company up in Denver. Uh, we have, <clears throat> I mentioned to you, Kyle Hibble and, and uh, Martin Wood, because they head advisory boards, the head of the advisory boards are automatically on the board of directors, so that's why those two are on there. We also have Christian Anschutz on the board, mm -hmm. and we also have uh, Rhett Hernandez, who you probably don't know, retired Army Lieutenant General, who I know very well, but who is a cyber expert. Uh, he stood up the Army Cyber Command years ago and commanded it, currently chairs the Army Cyber Institute at West Point, mm -hmm. but he's all over the country in, involved in cyber activities. So uh, that'll kind of give you an idea there that it's not UCCS-centric. And uh, the two individuals that we're looking at for the Rapid Response Center advisory board are definitely not UCCS affiliated. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, UCCS, as I say, has a role, an important role. Now, yeah, I see that too. Yeah, and, and the Cyber Research Education and Training Center, which is what Martin Wood, who is the Senior Vice Chancellor at UCCS, heads, um, it's, again, it's not UCCS. We already have a consortium of seven other universities from across the country. Uh, as, a, as a foundation for that, um, we're, uh, we're going to, the advisory board will be populated by folks from CSU, CU Boulder, us, but it's not going to be just academia. It'll be other institutions. We'll have, since there's training in there, we'll have some of the training organizations on that board. And since there's research, we'll be looking to see who is it that we want. Maybe it's going to be industry that we'll bring on the board for representing uh, research. So. So, and, and big, big, big picture there, that's, wow, you're pulling a lot of things together. Mm -hmm. One thing I, I came to mind as you were talking is private sector. Yep. Um, what's your thoughts there? I mean, literally, we just had a conversation before we started talking, our show, about how I spent a whole career in private sector, critical infrastructure, mm -hmm. and then government was a whole different animal. Mm -hmm. um, are we focusing too much on government and large entities? Because, you know, as well, a couple of the, the internet and national bodies and efforts I've been on, um, I would say could have been held back by their association with large interest. Because cybersecurity, anytime you view you're getting something for free from a company, something's under the control of Big Brother, mm -hmm. people start to shy away and say, well, who's benefiting from this yeah. is the individual getting their privacy or are big institutions running amok with who's in control. Yeah. So in my <laughs> idealistic opinion, cybersecurity needs to be pushed down, individualized the privacy. Are we, if we focus on big entities, government, universities, are we missing the mark? Um, it's a very good point and, and we are very sensitive to that. And, and because we are in the early stages of designing the organizations, this is an opportunity for us to make sure that we get it right. But I totally agree with you. The private sector, private industry is, the, is in my mind, who we should be targeting. We've been told, I've been told personally by folks that I've talked to, that uh, you need to uh, don't get DOD focused. 
for one thing. And that's easy to do given the military presence here. And so we mm -hmm. have to be very careful about that. We do I think we have to have a relationship with the military. And I've already talked to some folks and we're working with it. We'll be working with Air Force Base Command and West Point and that kind of thing. But we're not going to get DOD centric. We are focusing on the private sector. In my mind, as I indicated to you, it's uh, the, the primary customers should be the small businesses and, and the medium sized businesses. Now, where that becomes, I think, uh, where, where you will see it manifested is in the RRC. Uh, and I've just had a conversation today with the two individuals that were that we we're talking about uh, to lead that element about making sure that we focus on those those small and, and medium sized businesses because of obvious reasons. So w w our intent is to do that. Private sector is going to be the primary customer, particularly in the RRC. That's where I think that's going to be important. Mm -hmm. The Cyber Institute um, educating CEOs and things like that of smaller companies, we may grow to that. Uh, we'll start, as I said, with uh, elected officials. That's not federal. Mm -hmm. That's elected officials, states, state, go uh, state governors and things like that. And then in the CRETC, uh, we'll be focusing on workforce. Yeah, workforce development. So, so or for we, small firms too. Don't get me yeah. wrong. Excuse me. If we took it a step down and we said, who is cybersecurity? Who is privacy really for? Mm. Is it for the individual citizen? I mean, I hear once again, we're, we're at the organization, we're at companies, we're at small companies. You know, at some point, do we say that really cybersecurity is for the people? And how do we take a focus that says individual privacy? Yeah. And individuals should be focused in an effort above governments, organizations, companies, because ultimately that's the people you need to sign on to it. What's your thoughts there? Because I hear so much talk about companies and bringing organizations in, and, and honestly our, our talk about my involvement with the international groups and the, the federal government funded groups, the more the bigger companies got involved, the more it shut down, mm -hmm. the group attendance went down, special interest came in, mm -hmm. the direction went by vote to somebody something that was benefiting only that big company, mm. collecting big data. Do they care about the individual privacy? It's yeah. a question mark. Yeah, yeah. it is. And I, <clears throat> I'm not going to sit here and tell you we've got the answer. Yeah. Uh, I, I think we are sensitive to that. I would tell you, um, you, and this may seem like a stretch, but uh, for example, hacking target. It was the, the, what the data they got was on individuals. Mm -hmm. And so if you're able to protect Target from getting hit or any other company, whether it's big, small, or whatever, you in part are protecting individuals because their private data is being protected. So that may be a stretch, and I don't want to... If there was a way to say, and this is just hypothetical, yeah. that um, Target, no matter who comes to it to the store, doesn't really have the individual's privacy unless the individual gives, gives it, to it to them oh, sure. in the moment. How do we adjust to giving the privacy to the people and taking it away from Target? That's a good question, and I, that's, I'm not qualified to give, be able to give you an answer on that one. I'd, I'd, uh, I'd defer and I'd encourage you to ask somebody uh, who has a little bit more technical background yeah. on that. that uh, I would say that's when you get people involved. That's yeah. when you lighten up the public. That's when you take it down to the right level. Yeah. But that's my idealistic view again. <laughs> well, and there's nothing wrong with that, and I think it's important to bring that out. And I think it's certainly reasonable to say that's huge. I mean, that is really that's a huge undertaking. That in and of itself could be uh, the focus of a separate organization, just focusing on individual rights, and that could consume them. Uh, but I think it's not unrealistic to say that may be where we grow to. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we get going here, I, I'd, I'd like to believe that we're not going to go in the direction that you described where the big companies came in and then all the special interest groups come in and you know attendance starts going down and so on and so forth. I'd like to think we are not going to go in that direction. Yeah. Uh, that well, say, and this kind of back to the same, same type of thing is we're trying to include the masses. Yeah. I, Cybersecurity effort after cybersecurity effort that I've seen has isolated so much to big organizations mm. that they've stretched out 
the mass participation. Yeah. So at the same time, we have to instill a culture of adapting and grabbing, gravitating towards the next generation. Because at some point, the generation that's in decision making right now goes out. And uh, you know, there's many studies that say, why is information generation down, millennials and younger, why are they not engaging with the workforce mm -hmm. in the way that, that, that we think should be as a decision making generation that's a little bit older? Mm -hmm. How do we reach out and bring those people in? Because I've been to these cybersecurity events all over the world and every year the average age gets a year older. <laughs> How are we looking at with this effort to engage that younger demographic and that younger group of people who I, in, in going back into the last conversation, want privacy to be individualized. And in some aspects, Edward Snowden is their hero. Mm. How do we engage that generation with yeah, this well, effort? Uh, uh, Chris, I think the, the, way, the way you do it is you start communications. I mean, you've got to talk to them. There's no way that I could come forward and tell you a solution to solve the millennials issue because I'm not really that familiar with it. How do we start talking to them? How are we putting that into this effort? That, That's yeah. what I'm asking you. Yeah, and I think it's, it's a very, very good question. And I'd like to think that at some point here, there's a, uh, and it could be that it's through the, the CRETC uh, that that begins where we start bringing in the millennials. Because I mean, when you're talking about the universities, Millennials do go to universities. They are there. And so the opportunity to engage them is there and to get their feedback and that kind of thing, I think, is... Uh, is so do we... And, and back to the university, that's a good point because mm. we have so many people come here to these universities and go somewhere else to work. That's true. How do we keep them here? That's, first of all, you've got to have a job. You've got to have... And that's, that's probably one of the keys. Uh -huh. And that is one of the efforts that we're talking about when we talk about workforce development is we're not talking about just taking people and educating them or training them and then throw them out and let them figure out how to get a job. Mm -hmm. We want to do a better job of lining them up with a, with a job. And maybe that's the way we do it with but the millennials. Do we do something that makes sense in their culture other than a job yeah. but makes them have a good time here? What, what triggers them to be want to have a community here and want to build here? Well, I... I, there are many things, that, but it's a little bit away from what you're trying to get at. But I mean, Colorado is Colorado. <laughs> what more it, can you want it is. to be living here in, in heaven where you can go out every day and do whatever you want to do? Uh, so that's part of the incentive. But certainly that's for, and I would expect it's the same for millennials, it's the same for everybody. You want to have a job that you enjoy. You want to enjoy going to work every day and so on and so forth. It's not just living in Colorado that's going to be the key. So... Uh, part of that, though, part of that responsibility falls on the companies. You know, they are the ones who are providing the environment that these people are going to be working in. So all universities can do and, and training organizations can do is give them the tools. Mm -hmm. And then once they have the tools and once they get into the private sector, for the most part, or even the federal sector, for that matter, because the military is very short of cyber experts or cyber trained folks as well, uh, it's going to be the same situation. Uh, now, I mean, and I don't want this to sound wrong, but there, take a generation back, maybe it's the X generation, I'm not sure, uh, or maybe even before that. And part of the, especially for the federal workforce, part of the, and the military as well, part of the, the justification to those folks was you're doing something important. You are doing something for the company or for the country. You know, I, I, you know, I like that because I like seeing this effort as we're doing something for the world, That's it. for Colorado, yep. for everything involved and everyone yep. and keeping that Big Ten approach to everyone's involved. Yeah. Because I, I always like to say that, uh, that whenever you look at something that could be as big as the technology age, mm -hmm. if you looked at, and, and I look at, if you were licensing TCP IP, you had put together that internet capability and you said, well, you know, everybody that works in that environment pays a $200 royalty per employee per year. Mm -hmm. It is minuscule for companies, but the reach of it is extensive. Oh, yeah. And we're doing something that big for yep. the world. And every company and everybody at this key central, this epicentral of it will benefit from that, that growth. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And I, Colorado Springs could be 50 times what it is now in 10 years. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, and I mean, I like that, the way you characterize that. And, I've, and just, just in our discussion here in the last few minutes, you can, you can just get enthusiastic about yeah. it. You can get excited about it. And uh, that's what you'd like to think you're going to con you convey to the millennials and anybody else that's in the situation. You know, so. Absolutely. We want to hear our, our leaders like you say that. Yeah. And that that's the direction we're putting into it. Yeah. Because that's what we want. We want to be inspired by something. Absolutely. And so do, and so do I, and I'm not a millennial. Let me tell you. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks for joining. I guess one more thing. What's what's the path for you personally? You're looking for a replacement for yourself. Right. It's kind of I've been in that situation where I'm hiring my replacement. Yeah. What what comes next for you? Um, well, if you were to ask my wife, it would be retirement, <laughs> which I did several years ago, and she still doesn't believe me. <laughs> So, uh, I mean, I'm enjoying immensely what I'm doing with the NCIC, let there be no doubt. Uh -huh. And uh, I'd like to see or at least contribute to getting it up and running and getting it off the ground. And hopefully it'll it'll grow into that big thing that we're talking about. But, I mean, and I relate this to my experiences in NORTHCOM because it was for, in 39 years in the Army, it was the last two doing that, standing up that command, that was the most rewarding to me because you were starting something from scratch and now look at it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is an operational element that is tremendous. They've got great people over there and that kind of thing. And I'd kind of, that's what I'd like to see happen to the NCIC. And if I can help that, then I'm very happy and I'll retire and go fish and play golf. <laughs> well, you know what? I'd like to join you. Invite me sometime to go play. <laughs> okay, you're on. Fishing. I'm not sure about golf too much, but I'll go fishing with you. <laughs> well, I'm not a golfer either, but I like to golf. Let me put it that way. <laughs> I hear you with that one. Yeah. Well, thanks for joining today. And uh, here we're all about cybersecurity, talking about what the direction here is. And definitely heard it from the horse's mouth, the person who's taken the, horn, the, the bull by the horns to put this in the, mm -hmm. in the direction, in the, in the, actually, in the action. So... Thanks a lot for joining today, Ed, and uh, we look forward to seeing where this effort goes. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate that. Right. Have a great day. You too. Thank you. We hope you have enjoyed this episode of New Cyber Frontier. Remember to get involved. Often we think that someone else will handle privacy and security in the virtual world, but you are the only one truly in command of your virtual fate. Join our mailing list so we can keep you informed of breaking news and new releases. If you have an idea, if you have a question that you would like to hear answered, or if you want to get involved with our efforts, reach out to us at NewCyberFrontier.com. We also encourage you to visit our sponsors' links as they are the ones that really make this show possible. I want to thank each of you for supporting the show, and we look forward to seeing you back for the next episode of New Cyber Frontier.